Welcome to our first faculty lecture um, in 16-17 school year. Um, my name is Dr. Courtney Allen. I'm going to be hosting this year along with Christine Duran. She's kind of phasing out and I'm phasing in. Glad to see all your faces here. This is Dr. Brian Zwicker. He's from the Human Performance and Physi Physical Education Department. He's going to give you our talk tonight entitled, Why Do We Compete? A Return to the Olympic Ideal. We also have some other interesting, exciting topics. Have you guys got a chance to see our poster? Um, the next one is September 21st. Robert Dimsky and Michael Mumper will be talking, their, their talk is entitled, Making Sense of the 2016 Presidential Election. Um, Jeremy Yates, <laughs> right here in our audience, is gonna be um, October 5th, challenging the status quo through research. Super excited about that. Um, Meredith Anderson, November 2nd, a brief tour of Flatland. Um, November 16th, Richard Loosebrock, am I saying that right? So. Um, he's a professor in history, and his, title, his um, talk is entitled American Colossus, the NFL and American Culture. And then finally, we close out this semester on November 30th um, with Chris Gilmer, our new vice president, and he's gonna be um, presenting poetic reflections on Mama and Them. So a really wide variety this semester. We'll also have a lineup for the spring that we're putting together now, and we'll announce that um, as the semester continues. If you're not on our email list, and you'd like to be, so you can get a little email reminder when the next um, lecture is coming up, please feel free to add your email here, uh, collect it at the end of tonight's program. So without further ado, Brian Dewitter. Thank you, Courtney. <laughs> so I just want to say thanks to Christy and Courtney for kind of organizing this and everybody else that's involved in putting it together um, here at the university. It's a fun opportunity to kind of get to share something you're passionate about in a little bit different setting than the typical classroom or maybe academic lecture. Um, so when I was asked to, to do this, I was kind of like, well, what am I going to talk about? And um, the Olympics was going on at the time that, you know, Christy emailed me and said, you know, do you want to do this? And I was like, okay, like, you know, what can I do around that? Um, and I've, I've done research with Olympians. I've done um, worked with Olympians, helped coach some, and stuff like that. And so I was like, well, I could talk about that. But I want to talk about something that's sort of bigger than the Olympics and ties into <coughs> a lot of different things in life, um, not just simply sport. I'm going to talk about the sporting context a lot tonight. Um, but the idea of competition sort of in life um, and the importance of it and why I think uh, we should have it, but we've sort of maybe lost our way in our ideals behind it. So, the Olympics. It's a big deal, but it's really only a big deal for this really small window in time, every four years. And um, it sort of captures our attention. So much so that we maybe even forget about the typical things that are really popular in taking our attention. Um, you know, during that two-week period, I don't think I really heard nearly as much talk about these two as before and after kind of thing. Um, so it really does sort of captivate um, our society, whether you're into sport or not. There's just something about the Olympics that's sort of different than our typical professional sport that we follow and consume that sort of attracts people. We'll talk about that a little bit. So my dilemma was I had two weeks of watching the Olympics, and in particular track and field, um, a sport that I work with closely. Um, but that also meant two weeks I didn't get to see Jimmy Fallon. So that was kind of tough. Um, but uh, that's uh, my humor, which th my students will understand that. Others <laughs> um, So why are the Olympics so compelling to watch? And it's not, I'm not expecting you to answer this question out loud, but sort of think about why why is this event such a big deal? And this is one of the reasons why, I think. Because in this moment, we get to see people performing, sort of in the raw. Um, and nowadays, with social media and the coverage and everything that they have, they're live streaming a lot of the events online and things like that. So you could see a lot more than you ever could in the past. And in particular, the idea of competition is at the core of this. 
How many people watched the Olympics, or even if you didn't, maybe saw this in the news or the media? This was a popular thing. And everybody wants to know, what's he thinking? Well, I can tell you, I don't know. <laughs> I can make some guesses, but I think a lot of times we see things like this, we see interactions like this, and in particular in competition, people are going to assume, oh, he must really hate this guy. So if you, if you aren't familiar, Phelps lost to him by like, you know, a finger length the last time they competed in an international competition. And so they were building it up, you know, on TV and all that kind of thing, this competition between the two of them. And then this happens. And so everybody's just like, oh, you know, like. And I think a lot of times people think that's what you have to do to compete or to be highly successful, that you literally have to, like, hate your opponent. And I don't think that that's what's going on here. People probably read into that. But there's pictures of them later on, and they're like holding hands, celebrating, and smiling, and stuff like that kind of thing. So it's most likely that he doesn't hate you know, this other guy. A lot of times, competition has become that in society, where we have to hate the opponent, or we're taught to hate the opponent, and that that's a necessary sort of evil in, in competition. So this is another reason why we're so compelled by it. Hope and joy are driving forces of competition and play. It's fun to do it. And because of that, that fuels our desire to watch other people do it at a really high level. Because it's fun to see other people do it. And we can sort of try to, we can resonate with that because we've maybe experienced it, whether it's just simply in the backyard playing or in some level of competitive sport ourselves. And so this is kind of what attracts us to it. So I want to present a couple questions here, and we'll come back to them at the end, and hopefully we'll have a little bit of time to maybe have some discussion about this. But think about how you would define competition. This was a test question kind of thing. How would you define it? And then after that, would you say it's a good thing? And why or why not? And we're going to talk about this as we move forward here. Um, but I think a lot of times people are, it's a sort of a divisive topic. People are on one side and the other side, and we'll kind of get into why I think that is. So real quickly, I want to show you just a short video. Um, it's longer, but I'm only going to show you a short clip of it. This is LeBron James and Kevin Durant. So for those not familiar with the NBA, these are two of the best players in the NBA. Um, and this video here shows them training together. So in the off season, they work out together. Now, our typical connotations of what we know about what competition should be should say these two should hate each other. They shouldn't work out together. They should be trying to beat each other. But the reality is they know that if they want to get better, they got to be training together because they're going to push each other to get better. And yet they go head to head in the NBA Finals and compete. But you see, there's a, there's a respect there. Without watching it very long, you can see that there's some sort of friendship or cooperation there. And that, to me, highlights what competition really is. If we look at the root term, the Latin competere, is to strive together. And I think we've lost sight of that. And that's what you know, I'm going to tie into talking about the Olympics, is the Olympic ideal embodies this concept of strive together, as opposed to strive against. So if we go back to the origin of the Olympic Games with uh, Pierre de Coubertin, his goal was to have competition build international relations. And that the games were not so much about winning, but more about competing. This is a quote from him. 
The important thing in life is not the triumph, but the struggle. The essential thing is not to have conquered, but to have fought well. I'll go on to explain a little bit more of his background and the origin of the Olympic Games. The athletes, he, the idea was that they were going to compete sort of as individuals with the spirit of competition, not so much as USA versus Canada or USA versus Russia or versus Germany. It wasn't about this nation against this nation. And the logic there was it wasn't about nationalism, it was about competition. And really the, the sort of grand hope was that this would in theory replace war. And you know it's a great idea and it, has it worked? Not necessarily. We still have war, but it gives people some hope. It gives people a distraction for whatever time period that is. Part of why it hasn't worked is because we've lost sight of what it originally was. How many people caught this story with the Olympics? Team refugee. Yeah. This is pretty big and pretty cool because it is a great example of this Olympic ideal. So these are refugees who were athletes who were qualified for the Olympic Games to compete but did not have a country to represent. And the IOC and a lot of other um, countries and um, organizations came together and helped support these athletes. They allowed them to form a team. They came in in the opening ceremonies, marched together, walked together, um, and were able to compete. And you know, if you look into their stories, it's some pretty, pretty interesting things and some pretty cool things and some pretty awful things, unfortunately, that they had to overcome to get to where they are. Um, but it was a big step, I think, um, sort of on a global scale to say, you know, there's something bigger here than just simply winning and losing or my country against your country. I have another story here, example from the Olympic Games. Those that are track and field fans probably saw this, and even if you aren't, you maybe saw it. I just want to show a short little clip here of the incident. So that's a runner from New Zealand and a runner from the U.S. And you'll see here, And so the pretty amazing thing, aside from the fact that they sort of stopped and helped each other in the middle of the competition, is this woman from the US tore her ACL in that fall. She finished the race. <coughs> pretty inspiring thing and really embodies it. And I'm going to show an interview here, just real short with the two of them talking about the incident. So again, some hope that you know not all is lost in this um, competition debate of how we should be approaching it. This is important in this aspect, valuing it and modeling it. So a lot of times when we look at competition and the people involved in it, in particular at the lower levels, the youth sport levels, the high school levels. The people who are supposed to be the models for this often don't do a very good job of modeling it. And that's part of the problem as well. A lot of times the youth actually sort of get this stuff. But it's the adults that are involved in the scenario that tend to ruin things or steer them to the path of this negative side of competition. And this is a, another quick example. Um, this is from a tennis match um, it was this winter. And it made uh, the news, may or may not have seen it, 
Um, but I'll let you watch it here, then I'll explain. And so typically, you would think that, that, that negatively affected him in the performance. Most people, you know, it was called out. He could have just gone with it. But in the spirit of the game, out of respect for the rules and um, competition, which we're talking about here, the athlete says, hey, no, you should challenge it. You know, and it's that kind of stuff. That, that's the essence of competition. That's the essence of what we're doing. Because, you know, a lot of times we watch competitions and which ones are the ones that are most exciting? The blowouts or the close ones? Oh, the close ones. And they're exciting because we're seeing two people bring out the best in each other. And that's the essence of what we get. And so to sort of, it's more respectable and honorable to lose with integrity than to sort of win knowing I got away with something. But a lot of times people aren't taught that, unfortunately, like I said earlier, especially starting at a young age. When we look at comparing ourselves to other, which is what we're doing in competition, is this person better than this person, so to speak, is often what the way it's, it's projected. And yes, we compete against one another, and somebody is going to win and somebody is going to lose. That's the nature of it. But unfortunately, a lot of times people are taught that it's a personal thing, that the better person won, or you're not as good of a person because you lost, and we're going to love this person because they won. And that's something that we have to get rid of in our society. And that's bigger than just sport. But sport is a great avenue to teach this to our youth. So again, it's the idea that if I'm at my best and you're at your best, we're both going to go to a different level than we would have had I just been trying to do it on my own but I value and respect your effort in that process. Because I realize that without that, without you there pushing me, I don't get better. So we're gonna switch gears here a little bit and give you some explanations for what is sort of the negative side of it. And this is not a word I came up with. You probably won't find it in any dictionary. Um, but Shields and Bredemeyer have come up with this term to help clarify for people the difference between what is true competition, as they call it, or healthy competition, and what they have titled decompetition. So any college football fans, um, I saw this because I'm from Wisconsin and I'm a Badger fan. Um, but this was at the end of the game against LSU. LSU was ranked number five in the country. Wisconsin was winning at the time. LSU had a chance to potentially score. Um, they were sort of moving down the field late in the game. They threw an interception. Um, guy went down, the play is dead. He's sort of kind of running after the play. And he gets cheap shot it right to the face. And I saw some ESPN reporters who've been doing this for a long time said this is the most egregious cheap shot they've ever seen. That is decompetition. Plain and simple, really highlights it. There's lots of other variations of it that we'll talk about. But just flat out, I'm going after you because you beat me and, and I dislike you for that. The, prob the big problem with this is that it undermines performance. So my expertise area is in sports psychology, and we're going to talk about some things here on why this negative side of competition that a lot of people like to build up and say, this is what you need to do to win, actually has negative effects on our ability to perform. It creates stress. Puts the attention on defeating others rather than performing well. A lot of times when, you, when I sit down and work with athletes, we're talking about what do you need to work on to perform at a high level, not what other people are doing, controlling what you can control. When we make the competition out to be bigger than it is, 
our focus isn't on ourselves and what we need to do. It's about trying to worry about what they're doing. It completely destroys this, our intrinsic self-worth, because it's no longer about you performing better. It's about your self-worth is on the line, win or lose. You win, we love you, accept you. You lose, we'll love and accept whoever wins. And it sounds kind of harsh, but that's very true. Creates insecurity and undermines self-esteem. All things that have negative effect on performance. Undue anxiety, envy, humiliation, shame. How many times have you seen somebody just get completely humiliated on the sidelines by their coach or maybe a parent after the game because they lost? These things all have negative impacts on performance. And when you have maybe a lifetime in sport of experiencing this, and then say you're a college student and potentially sitting down talking to me about how can you perform better? And we start talking, we find out you got a lifetime of people doing this kind of stuff to you. That's hard to overcome. So we need to get back to building this stuff right from the beginning, back to that Olympic ideal of what this should be. From an ethical standpoint, it's wrong. Interpersonal hostility, prejudice, and aggression. Think about larger things in society now. And think about what kids are taught in sport. And it might seem like, oh, it's sport. You know, it, it doesn't matter. It's just a game. We can teach them to hate somebody else and to maybe intentionally hurt another player. But that stuff carries over into life. A belief that we benefit only at the expense of others. That creates problems in larger society too. Because now we have this idea that I have to have you suffer, or your performance has to go down, or whatever you're doing is going to be worse off in order to benefit me. And that's just not the case. It doesn't have to be that way. So society's response. Things are getting too out of control. It's too cutthroat. The competition is too intense. So let's just try to remove it. That's a good idea, right? We'll give everybody a participation ribbon. We'll give everybody a trophy, whatever it is. Everybody did a great job. Sounds like maybe a good idea, because it's all just about having fun at a young level. And I'm for that. I'm not for what happens down the road when they don't understand how to compete. They don't understand how to handle success and failure. They don't know how to win and lose. And they're going to face that at some point in their life. And so we're setting them up for failure with this model. And it's a colossal failure in some cases. Like I said, they miss this opportunity. This is unbelievable benefit, I think, of competition, and in particular, sport. You can teach people how to manage this stuff at a young age, and then it can parlay over into other things they're doing in life. Understanding this effort-based concept. There's a thing in education called growth mindset that Carol Dweck has done a lot of research around. And it's the idea that a lot of people have a fixed mindset or a growth mindset. Growth mindset is the understanding that if I put in effort over time, I can get better. Fixed mindset says I either have it or I don't. And a lot of times this negative competition fosters a fixed mindset. Because, well, I've lost my first five games when I'm like eight years old, so clearly I suck at soccer. And so I maybe should stop doing this and go try a different sport or just stop playing sport altogether. And that might sound kind of drastic, but that kind of stuff happens on all varying levels. And like I said, further down the road, they're not equipped with the skills to cope when they're faced with getting a, not getting an A or not getting you know, stars on their assignment or you know, they lose a competition, heaven forbid. So back to sort of the positive side. 
This improves performance. Creates relaxation and al that aligns with optimal performance and puts the attention back on the process, not the outcome. And this idea of how can I maximize what I have, personal excellence. From the psychological side, it builds this intrinsic self-worth. Because now it's not attached to the outcome, it's attached to am I getting better than where I was a couple of days ago or however long time period you're measuring. Builds confidence and self-esteem and creates all the things we want to have going. Pride, honor, respect, those kind of things. And from the ethical standpoint, creates interpersonal care, understanding, and compassion. You saw that in the runners. In the moment, in the biggest moment of their lives at the Olympic Games, they were in the race. It wasn't like they were just at the back of the pack. You saw in the clip, they were in the mix when they went down. So it wasn't like, oh, there was nothing on the line anymore. It mattered. But in that moment, there was something bigger than that. The just caring for the person next to you, whoever that person is. And that we can benefit from each other's effort. This is the idea behind that root Latin term, competere, strive together. And if we talk about peak performance in my world, that's a big thing trying to help people perform at a really high level, whatever that might be, in particular in sport. If you don't have a worthy adversary, you're probably not going to get there. If you win all the time, like I joke with coaches that if they want to have a winning record, just schedule a bunch of people that have less talent than you, and you'll have a winning record, and you can walk around and be like, yeah, great. Yeah. But that's not going to bring out the best in your team. You want to push yourself. You want to schedule people that are maybe at your ability level or a little bit above because you know that that's what's going to bring out the best. But we lose sight of that a lot. The better your opponent performs, the higher the bar set, the bigger that challenge becomes. Teaching kids and athletes and people to embrace that concept. That that's going to allow me to push myself. And so we actually want our opponents to perform well. But think about how many times coaches and people and parents and kids walk around saying, oh, I really hope that you know, they suck or I hope you know, their quarterback gets hurt because then we'll win or whatever it is, you know, kind of thing. And that's the opposite of what we want. We actually want them to perform well because that should elevate our performance. So back to sort of application, real world things that I work with, and in particular here at our university, a great example. Don't have to go very far. I've shown some examples of some bigger things. I wanted to show one, some people that I've gotten to know personally in the last couple of years, very closely. They've won 50 national titles over the years. A big piece of it, a lot of people always want to know what's the secret to success kind of thing. It's a very complicated puzzle, but one of the big pieces in the puzzle is this concept. There is a ton of competition on this team. There's times where I'm out at practices watching a runner who's maybe 15th in the workout, let's say, you know, as far as order. And they maybe think, man, I'm getting my butt kicked today. But they sometimes lose sight of the fact that 10 of them in front of them are probably all Americans. And so they're probably a top 30 runner in the country. But on their own team, they maybe barely crack the top 10 or 12. That's what drives a lot of it, is competition. Now you'd think that could get really cutthroat. So you have to be able to manage that. And so a big thing we talk about is this idea of pursuing excellence. And what does it mean to really compete? 
and push yourself and to push each other and be proud of your teammate when they bring it and if they beat you they beat you you pat them on the back and you go you go at it again and, and try to get them the next time but it's this idea that striving together is what pushes them to greatness now it's not the only piece of the puzzle but it's it's a big one so why is this so important why am i making a big deal out of it the opportunity to learn and grow it's such a great teaching tool if capitalized on the right way helping people understand that it's the process and I'm not saying winning doesn't matter it does we just don't focus on that we just don't make that the big deal we make the process the big deal and improvement the big deal and that's what we can control and if we happen to win great if we don't it's not necessarily something we can control we can only control how we prepare in our mindset and our approach And like I've been talking about, this is what drives people to be great. So if we remove this, or if we have this in this negative connotation, that's inhibiting our ability to perform at a high level. And that's true across platforms, not just in sport. So I want to bring it back. Um, I think we have time to discuss some things. Um, yeah. So I would like to pose these questions again and really maybe, you know, hopefully whether you agree with me or not, you've got some opinion on the first two. But sort of this larger question of how can we use competition to improve or better our society? I'm curious what your thoughts or experiences are on this topic. Questions for me related to things I've talked about. I, yeah. Uh, this reminds me a lot of the, I can't say his last name, but the psychology of flow or flow. Yeah, flow Chixent Mahali, I believe is. How do you say it? Chixent Mahali. Yeah, there's so many consonants. I yeah, know. and I might not be saying that quite but, right. There's pronunciation for it in yeah, my book. I've read you know, his books, but yeah, go ahead. But seeing uh, videos of LeBron James and Kevin Durant working together, is that they're pushing each other and they're increasing opportunities for flow, so you're never static. Mm -hmm. You know, because I imagine if they just practice by themselves, they, they reach this sort of stasis and get bored. Yep. They're pushing each other. They never get that bored. And so they're always evolving. Yeah. So that's and sort one, of what reminds me. And yeah, definitely. And see that video, and you see that video, they get maybe a different understanding. Yeah. And so flow, for people that aren't familiar with it, this is sort of the the holy grail kind of thing that we're after in sport a lot of times. It's what we call being in the zone. Um, and what we actually know about it from being in real competitive sport is that it's really hard to get into in competitive sport because we keep track of who wins and loses. When you remove that factor, it's easier to get sort of in that zone because then it's not so much about the outcome. And even if you're really process oriented, um, invariably you know that there's a winner and a loser. But one of the things in flow is the challenge skills balance. That's one of the characteristics that they look at to see whether or not um, how to help people try to get into flow. And so what you're saying is exactly right. Kevin uh, Durant and LeBron James, their challenge skills balance for most people, they, you know, the challenge, their skills are way up here and the challenge is down here. And you see that sometimes with professional athletes. It maybe seems like they're going through the motions until they get against, you know, until LeBron goes against Durant or goes against Kobe or whatever it is, and you could put this in any sport, all of a sudden you see them sort of be more engaged. They raise their game to a different level. And that's the idea that, that challenge skills balance and flow. If we can better match that, we have a better likelihood of getting peak performance out, which ties in really well. So yeah, thanks. Yeah. You, you, you didn't did, did talk about sports when uh, money's involved. Yeah. 
So you're saying, how does it does, does it change when money's involved, or how does that does impact it? Correlation between non sportsman conduct and more money. I wouldn't necessarily be able to answer that as far as is there a direct correlation, but I would say it definitely impacts it. Um, again, that comes back to that would get into a discussion of motivation. And what's your motivation? And that's definitely a piece to the puzzle when you're talking about competition. And so if you're motivated to get that money more so than anything else, you're highly likely to maybe abandon those values or beliefs you have about the spirit of competition and all that kind of stuff. And you know, I'm gonna do whatever it takes literally to beat you because I want that money so badly. Does that kind of help explain? Yeah, yeah, it, sure. it, it complicates things when you put that factor in there. But you can <coughs> see, I mean, Kevin Durant and LeBron James make a lot of money. And you can maybe make the argument that they make so much money that they don't care about the money. And they can be more intrinsically based and have this kind of approach. But I would argue that's also a big reason why they've been successful. Because when we look at highly successful people in general, and in particular athletes, they're not doing it for the gold medal. They're not doing it for the money. Yes, they want to get those things, but when they get them, they don't talk about that. They talk about all this other stuff that's process oriented and sort of what that medal or what that championship or that trophy or that ring or that paycheck sort of represents is all this other stuff that they put into it, which has to do with challenging themselves to see what they're capable of. So, yeah, it's not a, the money thing makes it tricky, but I, I, I believe, and if you look at, the, you know, I think there are examples where it can be done in the context with money still involved. Because in the business world, that's reality. Money's involved. Um, and there's a lot of studies that show that if we pay people more, that doesn't necessarily motivate them more. And so, it's, a, it's an interesting thing. Yeah, Jeremy. So uh, you mentioned motivation. We we're talking about uh, healthy competition versus decompetition. And then, so how does uh, the, the continuum between intrinsic motivation, extrinsic motivation, a motivation, those yeah. types of things within the self determination theory? Yeah. How could we use that type of research to help teach some of these healthy competition aspects and get past the trophy for everyone. Yeah. It's extrinsic. Um, I really like the self-determination theory, um, the research, the concepts there. For, so for those of you that may not be familiar with that, the, in simplest terms, autonomy, competence, and relatedness are the three things that they look at that if you have those things going for you or one of those three things going for you, you're gonna have a higher likelihood of being more intrinsically motivated. So autonomy, do I have choice and feel like I have some sense of control in my life? Competence, do I feel like I have some level of mastery in some sort of skill? And relatedness, what kind of relationships? How am I connected to others around me? And through that, I think, is the answer, really. You know, when you think about it, you think about those three things that I just said there, and you think about a lot of the things we talked about on the positive side and on the negative side. Um, a lot of the sport environment that has a negative competition, look at how much autonomy those athletes probably have. Probably a lot more often it's going to be an authoritative, dictatorship style of leadership. How, what kind of relationship do they have with the people involved in sport? Probably not a great one. How often do they feel like they're competent at something? Probably not very often because somebody's telling them and pointing out all their mistakes they're doing all the time. And so, to me, that's, that research is huge in application um, in a lot of different factors. And, the, and that research wasn't started in sport. That was started in looking at people in general and, and successful people in general and motivation and things like that. And we've taken it and used it in sport and tested it out and found out it works pretty well there too. So yeah, does that kind of answer your question? I, th I think that's, 
exactly what we need to be having more research that demonstrates that and also probably the bigger thing is getting it to people so that they understand how to apply it to coaches to Maybe coaches in particular is a big thing for me that's a big thing one of my missions is coaching education and I put a lot of onus on the coaches because they're the controllers of that sporting environment and the kid comes in at a young age that's their that's where they meet sport they often maybe don't know a lot about it other than they're just like running around and my friends are there <laughs> and everything they learn from that point on is either from their parents or you know family members and in particular that coach and so I think that's a huge way you know to answer that last question um, I think coaches are a big piece to that puzzle and in particular at the youth sport level because there's way more of them running around than the ones that get paid millions of dollars and at that point it's hard to go back and change things if we can get them at the beginning and build it right we're going places and to me I think it answers the question about society because I think there's a direct correlation they carry over and kids pay attention in sport they don't often pay attention in math history and English class but they pay attention when they go to basketball, football, soccer, baseball, swimming, whatever it might be. And so when they're paying attention, they learn stuff. And if they're being taught this negative side of competition, that's what they're learning. And we could teach them the positive side all day long in the other stuff, but if they're not paying attention, they're not learning. So, and that ties back into getting their attention Give them autonomy, build a relationship with them, build up their competence. You'll get them engaged and you'll get their attention and you can teach them. Other thoughts, questions? The students are scared. They don't want to go down that path. No, You're technically in class right now, so what, what are your thoughts? I, I guess I would say as a athlete, former athlete, that competition is like a great thing, or like a good, at least a good thing. Because, um, I mean, many times for me when I ran, especially in junior college, uh, you know, there's not always times where you just jump ahead of the competition. Usually you're at that same area you make small improvements, and the same people around you at those times make those same improvements with you. So I have like many friends who were on rival teams who, um, I mean, not like the coach, but I like them. <laughs> you know, I like running with them, and I've met multiple times over the years and ran with uh, athletes who were my rivals, who were people yeah. I was supposed to not like, but have not mm -hmm. been friends. And so I would say competition is a great thing for fostering friendship with other people. Yeah, and it's sort of an international language in a way. You know, that's the sort of the essence of the Olympic Games, to try to break down some of those barriers. Um, athletes I know that have gone to these international competitions, whether it's as juniors or senior athletes, or even just to you know a national high school competition. Anytime you're in those settings, or even the state meet or something like that, you see that a lot. You often see people that then maybe they go to the same college later on and they become teammates, but they were friends before that, even though they were rivals or competitors. So yeah, thanks. Yeah, Miranda. I would say that. Competition is good. Too much of a competitive, na competitive nature can be dangerous. Yeah. And I'll be the first to say that I'm a very competitive person, and it gets in the way of a lot of things sometimes. <laughs> I think yeah. The first conversation I had with Erica was, I won't compete with you anymore. I can't keep up, so I guess I'll befriend you. <laughs> and she didn't even know I was competing with her. Yeah. So I have a very dangerous competitive level in me. Yeah. And it can ruin some things in my life. Yeah. But and competition in general is healthy. Mm -hmm. It teaches you those important lessons. Yeah. And without, you know, going too far into things, I'll kind of ask you the same question I asked the undergraduates in class today. Um, why do you why do you think that is? And not necessarily you don't have to answer for yourself, but just people in general cuz that's a common thing. You're not the only one by any means. Uh, probably stems from when I was four and my dad said, um, sound real bad. My dad <laughs> basically. You don't have to say it if you don't want to. You can I sort of generalize it. And my dad basically sat me down and said, no one's going to like you if you're not a winner. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's a fairly common thing, unfortunately. And 
it's, and it's not that, like, I think from a parent standpoint, I said this in class today too, parenting is a difficult thing. And more often than not, I'm not a parent, but I've got firsthand experience in watching my brothers and, and other people. Um, and so I think a lot of times the intention is good. The outcome or the product that gets out isn't always necessarily what we maybe think want it to be or later on would be like, oh, you know, kind of thing. We, I think they see other stuff and they see, well, that's how it's supposed to be, so that's what I have to do with my kid because that's how those people were successful and I need to do that. And the thing is, sometimes we see people that are successful doing this and we think, oh, that's how you do it. More often than not, they're being successful in spite of that and they could probably be a lot better off. And if nothing else, they'd be happier. There's a lot of successful people that are miserable. You can go to Barnes and Nobles and there's a laundry list of pro athletes that have memoirs about their lives. And it's not exactly high quality life, but they won a lot of championships. And so that's that negative side of the decompetition. I'm not saying it doesn't work. I'm just saying it comes with a lot of excess baggage that inhibits performance. Yeah, Erica. Uh, I also think people kind of strive away from the idea that a lot of younger kids and even to college level, uh, a lot of people use competition as a way to kind of escape reality and the source, to kind of just get away from the stress of the day and just go do something that they know they're going to have fun doing. They're going to yeah. have all their attention engaged in this one activity. Yeah. I feel like a lot of people, um, I know I hear my coach, she used to say it all the time, like, use this time to just let go of everything else, but for mm -hmm. some kids, they might not, they might have a great life, they might not mm -hmm. understand the importance to another individual, like yeah. myself, competition was huge to get away from my parents who were always arguing, or the stress that they put on me with school, so. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that pursuit of excellence can be an outlet, potentially, for people, mm -hmm. is kind of what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And again, if that's your outlet, and then your outlet is, again, sort of a negative environment, potentially, that could really compound things, you know? So if sports your sort of your haven, your time to get away from things, that makes it really difficult if it's not really that. And I think that's often the case a lot of times for people. So probably yeah, competition right. is a good thing if it's done right. Yeah, so definitely. It's not, it's not done right. Yeah. I, I, yeah, yeah. I mean, I again, I, I come, I come back to, I come back to coaches. I put a lot on coaches. Um, I'm one myself, and so I feel like I can call us out in that category because I'm calling myself out. Um, and so it's, uh, that's a big piece to it. And then, and then parents. And so finding ways to educate not only coaches but parents. And so to me, through school systems is a great way to do that. If we could get um, my mentor, my PhD program, I helped him start a program where we, in the state of Missouri and sort of across the country, are trying to get schools to adopt a, a philosophy that, he, that he's called a positive coaching philosophy. And it adopt it from the top down. So superintendents, principals, athletic directors are saying, look, this is our philosophy, this is our mission, we're going to do things the right way, and everybody below has got to buy in. And now we're getting them at that level. And then their parents are going to start going, well, what's this about? And you can start to educate the parents, and they'll start to see, you know, little Johnny and Susie are coming home from practice, and they're happier. They want to go back to practice as opposed to, I, I don't want to go to practice today. You know, so those are ways that we can change that. And so to and through sport, and, and coaches are the platform there, but if we can get to people at the school level system, so elementary, middle school, high school level, I think that's where you can get people because for you know 90% or higher probably, that's where they're all going, the one place they all go to. The parents and the kids have to go there in some capacity. After that, we, we don't have a lot of control over how we contact them. So instead of just simply going to say, hey, you're a coach and I'm going to talk to you, I'm going to get you to buy into this, that's great, but that's just one person. 
we can go and get superintendent and the principal and, and the athletic directors on board. Now we've got all the coaches and they can get all the athletes. And then I've only got to get to one superintendent maybe as opposed to 20 coaches at every school. And in theory, that could happen every single place in the country. And we're working on that. I'm working on that here. There's people all over the country like myself that are working on that. Um, and I think it's making a difference. And the other thing is they're the future coaches. People that are older or further into it or maybe harder to change their ways. But if we can impact them and the undergraduates and other people that are going out, they're going to have a better understanding of this. And hopefully, if nothing else, they remember what was maybe done to them and go, I don't want to do that to other people. And that's part of the problem, too, is that habituates itself. I go out and coach, and if I had an abusive, negative coach, I get out there, it starts to get tough, I get frustrated, and athletes making mistakes. Suddenly, the nice, calm person is acting like the person that they had, modeling it for them when they were younger. They, we revert back to what we know, and if what we know is this bad model, we're going to inherently probably teach that again, because we, we revert back to coaching the way we were coached a lot of times. And if that was positive, then good, but if it wasn't. So that's where we have to break that cycle, and hopefully that's what we're doing through education, and the university's an awesome platform for that. Yeah, any other thoughts? So, um, possibly related, but um, how important is it to keep the fun in competition? Because other than my teaching responsibilities, you know, I, I have that professional bowling career, and oftentimes I get a lot of questions just to go bowling with a lot of people. And for me, it's really hard to, um, you know, separate that, have that fun aspect in my own sport. Um, yeah. and, and then I find myself just working on something. Yeah. You know, but a lot of my coaches over the years too have said, you know, got to keep that fun in the competition. Yeah, and so it's, it's about redefining what fun is, I think. A lot of times people, when I suggest that they need to make sport fun because that's what will make kids come back to it, we have tons of research that says the number, reason, number one reason why kids quit sport is not fun anymore. Number one reason why kids sign up for sport, it's fun. But we have this connotation in society that fun means uh, we all laugh and tell jokes, we can't be serious, it doesn't matter if we win, we're just goofing around. And, and that can be fun, but competing at a really high level and pushing yourself and challenging yourself can be fun too. So I challenge people to redefine fun as having fun pushing yourself to where you think your limits maybe are or beyond that. And that process is fun. But I don't think a lot of people are taught that that's what that that can be fun. It's work. We got to go to work. You got to stop having fun now. We're going to practice. And we're going to work. No, you can have fun while pushing yourself at a high level. And so I think in how you keep the fun in competition is you're looking at challenging yourself. And it's not about I'm beating the people that I'm bowling with if they're potentially at a lower skill level than you. That's not what it's about. It's just about sharing in that moment and, and having fun doing it. And you can do your thing without making it out to be, you know, like if I, you know, go run with like my dad or something like that, I could drop him in the first quarter mile. But that's not the point. And so is it not fun for me to run with my dad? No, that's not the point. So I think it's just kind of keeping things in perspective and trying to figure out what, um, what your sort of purpose is with it. And I think, again, grounding it in that idea of personal excellence, chasing that is the fun, not necessarily just goofing around and, and telling jokes. And you can do both at the same time. Sometimes telling a joke in a really tense situation is a really good thing, because it calms the athlete down, and they go out and they perform pretty well. So you, know, you can have fun and, and compete at a really high level all at the same time. And you can have fun and compete at lower levels, I, I, I think. Just have to keep things in perspective.
that's sometimes hard to differentiate, sort of turning that off, maybe kind of like what Miranda was saying, like you're a really competitive person. You're, you seem like you're hard, hardwired that way almost. But now I'm not in a situation where maybe that's a socially appropriate. And so I have to maybe learn how to dial that back, and that's, that's a skill too. Yeah, yes. I think Miranda uh, said um, being too big of a competitor can be dangerous. Yeah. And uh, I think about some of the greatest athletes in their sports. Like Kobe Bryant is an example that pops in my head. Yeah. Everyone around Kobe, his teammates, everyone that competed against him said that he was the biggest competitor they've ever been around. Mm -hmm. And so um, Kobe, when he retired, he wrote this letter. And he like titled it, I forget what title it, but it was like to my younger self or something. Yep. And he um, talked about how uh, you know his drive kind of led into poor relationships with his family and that kind of thing. Yeah. And so uh, a couple of questions. One of them is um, when do you think uh, being that big of a competitor turns into a negative thing? And uh, I guess it's kind of the same question. How, like, when do we cross that line to where it becomes uh, harmful? Yeah, so it's, I'll take a you know, crack at answering it. It's not necessarily an easy question to answer, but first off, for those that maybe are interested, the article he's referencing, really good read, and there's lots of other ones like it by other pro athletes that they've written these, they call them letters to my younger self. And it's pretty cool, because it highlights a lot of the stuff I'm talking about. Um, it's an uh, organization called the Players Tribute, and it was started by Derek Jeter, and it's this idea that they give a platform for athletes to talk candidly about whatever they want, um, and it's pretty cool. There's a lot of really interesting stories and insights into, um, it's sort of, you know, they don't hold anything back, they tell it like it is. So if you're curious about some of this kind of stuff or wonder, you know, what, what it's like, um, really good resource. So back to the question, um, when does it sort of become too much or when does it become harmful? I think it's going to depend on the person. But I also think when your motivation changes from more of that intrinsic, internal, chasing personal excellence and gets too far maybe towards the external extrinsic, I'm just, I'm just doing whatever I can to beat you, kind of thing. And, you know, that could potentially be a gray area, but, um, you know, I think when your intentions change, that's not necessarily a gray area, that's pretty definitive. Um, and so helping if you're working with athletes or you know people or you're thinking about, you know, applying things to yourself potentially, I would, I would try to stay grounded in what you value because those are core things in your life in general. And if you value a lot of the things that fall on the competition side and you stay grounded in that, that should help you from all these extrinsic external things that want to sort of take us to the, the dark side, so to speak, if we want to make a Star Wars reference. Yeah. Does that kind of make sense, resonate? Like, and again, it's, it's not an easy thing. I'm not trying to make this out like it's, you know, I'm perfect at this or anything like that. You know, this is a struggle for everybody. But that's also why it's so important to talk about it. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah. Or? So maybe I have time for one or two more if anybody really wants to. Otherwise, I think. Well, I'd, I'd just say yeah. something's come to mind to remind you of to me, it seems to be two things. If you can have joy in competition, joy in the moment, whether it's running or swinging a bat, just feeling the joy. And then with competition, uh, or strive against the competition, there's that sense of egoic cry that I beat my competitor. Mm -hmm. in that. And I, I wonder if over time, if it gets to that, you lose that sense of joy, the reason why you were doing the thing in the first place. And I would argue that that's the case. That's at least experientially. What I've experienced in working with athletes as a coach, as a sports psychology professional, um, as an athlete myself, um, yeah, that resonates. The idea that over time, too much of that 
we, we lose sight of the fun. It's not fun anymore. I see a lot of kids come in and they just, they don't have that drive, that passion anymore that they did. And it's slowly just been sort of squeezed out of them almost, you know? And getting that back is a challenge. And I think that's why it's so important to try to stay grounded in that, you know, early on. But yeah, that's a really good way of sort of highlighting that, so yeah. Any other final thoughts? All right, I think that's it. Thank you for coming. Thank you for asking questions and participating. LSC makes it more fun, um, getting people engaged. So um, yeah, thanks, enjoy the rest of your evening.